Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, our ongoing series here at the uh, Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. We're very uh, pleased and honored today to have Ambassador Chris Hill with us uh, to speak on an issue which has acquired certainly a greater degree of salience in the 2020 election campaign, which is the question of uh, the U.S relationship with the Asia Pacific region and of course its major player the People's Republic of China and to look at both the issues that arise out of this region and how they connect to the average concerns uh, of the US citizenry in order in other words take this discussion somewhat out of the realm of abstract grand strategy and bring it to uh, in essence, the doorstep of the American voter. Why does this region matter? Why does U.S. policies towards China and the other countries uh, of the Asia Pacific region matter uh, to uh, the American citizen's sense of security, prosperity, uh, enjoyment of uh, the blessings of liberty? Uh, and also within this discussion to really also connect the dilemmas that policymakers face in this region where the United States does not have complete freedom of action, where the United States cannot simply insist upon a long list of values and interests and expect compliance, where policymakers must in fact make hard choices between different types, different coalitions of values and interests, and how this is likely to play out uh, in the foreseeable future and as we move into the 2020s. Uh, Ambassador Hill's biography is being shared with you now through the chat and will be available uh, through linking uh, into the transcript of this event when it becomes available after uh, the conclusion of our live event. Uh, but let me just simply say Ambassador Hill is, uh, in my opinion, uh, one of America's most distinguished diplomats. He has played critical roles over the last 30 years in some of the most uh, protracted issues that have bedeviled uh, subsequent administrations in terms of addressing uh, questions uh, of peace and security. First with the uh, impact of the collapse of Yugoslavia and ending a particularly bloody uh, and vicious conflict in Bosnia in the 1990s, uh, then being uh, handed responsibility for dealing uh, with a crisis that many people uh, have considered to be one of the uh, top three national security challenges to the United States, that is uh, North Korea, its pursuit of a nuclear weapons program, and the question of uh, that uh, regime's ability or willingness to threaten its neighbors and really the world with uh, uh, a nuclear weapons program. And then forging uh, a coalition of powers that themselves don't always see eye to eye to try to uh, achieve verifiable results to at least arrest this problem uh, so that we could all sleep a bit safer at night. And then of course, his role in the Middle East, uh, in Iraq, uh, and uh, dealing with uh, uh, all of the issues that have erupted uh, in that part of the world and which also continue to be uh, issues that uh, we are confronted with as we move forward. Uh, also, uh, just as a plug for my other institution, uh, he is a distinguished graduate of the U.S. Naval War College, uh, where I also teach, although I'm appearing today in my capacity as a, a senior fellow here at the, uh, at the Carnegie Council. Um, we could have asked Ambassador Hill uh, to talk on any number of these issues, but uh, we've brought him here today uh, primarily in his role uh, as a expert uh, and practitioner uh, involved in the Asia Pacific region, uh, his role in the six party talks, his role in particularly navigating the US-China relationship in the context of those talks, his role as ambassador uh, in South Korea uh, to really uh, guide us uh, to guide our audience uh, as to uh, the importance of Asia, 
uh, to us uh, as Americans, why this part of the world matters, why American involvement in this part of the world matters, and some of the challenges that either a second term Trump or a first term Biden administration uh, may need to navigate uh, moving forward. So with that, uh, Ambassador Hill, uh, the floor is yours uh, and uh, we look forward to your remarks. Uh, what we'll do as always with, uh, with uh, our events here at, uh, at the Carnegie Council is the uh, chat and question and answer format is open. Uh, feel free to uh, enter in any uh, question or comment you have. Those will be co collated and collected uh, by uh, the council. And then we will uh, present those to Ambassador Hill for uh, his comments and his opinions. So with that, I turn the floor over to you, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Nick. And let me just say what a pleasure it is to be here with the uh, Carnegie Council. It's a special pleasure to be here with a professor from the Naval War College. Thank you. Last time I was talking to a professor, I was explaining why I didn't get all my homework done. Since you tended to assign three books per night. And uh, as one officer said to me, it's only a lot of homework if you actually do it. So uh, anyway, great pleasure. And, uh, and it's a great pleasure and frankly, a great challenge to talk about the U.S. relationship in Asia. I, I think... Um, you know, for many Americans, they're very familiar with the alliance system in Europe, that is NATO, very uh, familiar with the threat uh, that emanated from the Soviet Union. And uh, when we now transfer that sort of body of knowledge and instincts and uh, uh, sort of approaches to Europe, it doesn't quite work in Asia because it's, uh, I would say, in many respects, a far more uh, complex uh, animal to deal with. First of all, there is no sort of multilateral alliance system there. Uh, there's certainly the ASEAN, the Association of Southeast a Asian uh, Nations, but that's more of a sort of a consensus uh, uh, approach to things and one in which uh, uh, security is probably not the most uh, important elements. It's an effort to try to have countries uh, sort of uh, get together in, in uh, annual meetings, talk about problems, see if there's a way forward. Um, I remember trying to, as a, as a uh, the United States is of course, uh, one of the uh, participants in something called the ASEAN Regional Forum. And we were trying to get people used to actually doing things and to uh, try to uh, have countries actually cooperate in, in things. The uh, Singaporeans pushed for a tabletop exercise uh, at one point, and then that, that uh, caused a lot of differences on the tabletop uh, exercise on, on maritime uh, security. But all the countries have very different attitudes to maritime security, especially if you're a country like Indonesia that has something like 14,000 islands or the Philippines that has a similar number of islands. And you have issues of what is the sovereignty of the sea between those islands or among those islands. So uh, extraordinary uh, complexities of trying to get people to work together, develop consensus on, on those types of things. In Europe, meanwhile, we had something called the Partnership for Peace. So back in the 90s, you could see events like a, uh, you could see a Russian uh, uh, ship bringing US uh, Marines onto the Polish coast and the Marines would, would get off the landing uh, uh, ship and manage to set up a, a hospital for a drill in case you had some kind of natural disaster. So really there were efforts to do this. And I think in, in the Pacific, it's proved very difficult. Uh, certainly, and uh, we might as well start talking about the elephant of the room very quickly, and that is China. Now, I think it's fair to say that if you look at American history, we do seem to go without a foreign policy every four years. And we're, we're all comfortable with that. We know that you know, not a lot's gonna happen in foreign policy during an election year. And in particular, when we have someone out there, something out there that has caused a lot of, I think, uh, uh, concerns in the United States, whether it's trade, whether it's uh, uh, security, whether it's ethics and human rights as well, uh, certainly that country, I think, uh, gets particular scrutiny. And certainly China has kind of uh, led the way in this regard in, in recent elections. But I would argue that, uh, not to call it China bashing, but there was certainly a lot of aspects of, you know, let's let the Chinese know what we feel about them. 
uh, something is different. Something is kind of more serious. To back up a little, we always had the Soviet Union for that purpose. Were we being tough enough on the Soviet yep. Union? Were we looking for some channels of, of communication? But there's something, I think, different about China. By the way, we also had issues of countries that are actually uh, our allies, such as Japan. If you go back to the 80s and you remember when the Japanese uh, bought Rockefeller Center, there was this sense, oh, my goodness, today it's Rockefeller yeah, Center. Center. Tomorrow it'll be the Empire State Building. What's going to be left in our country? So we do have these issues in foreign policy, and they usually come up in the context of fear and loathing during a, uh, a campaign. I would argue, however, in 2020, we have something a little deeper, a little more serious, and a little more in intractable in terms of how we're going to uh, move ahead uh, with China. Um, I don't think it's been easy to say, well, China is just the new Soviet Union. We had challenges with the Soviet Union. We have challenges with China. We just need to increase military spending and uh, ramp up our support with allies, and you know, we'll handle it. We'll, we'll take care of it. But in fact, China, I think, presents enormous uh, challenges for us also in our economy, something uh, the Soviet Union never understood economy. I mean, they were never real players in the world, maybe a few raw materials. But China is a big player. They're probably the greatest manufacturing power the world has seen or has ever seen at this point. So we have to, as we look at, at the issue of whether we're dependent on China, we certainly felt this during the uh, during the, uh, the onset of the COVID uh, mm. crisis, where we didn't even feel we we could get more, uh, you know, PPE, more masks, and other. Uh, uh, um, materials like that because uh, it was all made in China, which is a long way away from the U.S. And so that uh, began a whole discussion about supply chains. You know, most Americans go through their lives without talking about supply chains, but certainly in the last few months, a lot of people are talking about supply chains and how do we shorten them? How do we make sure that we have materials that we need closer at hand rather than uh, depending on the Chinese? In addition, of course, China has run enormous surpluses uh, with the United States. Now, as any economist will tell you, and the Chinese have a lot of economists, and good ones, by the way, they'll tell you bilateral deficits don't matter. It's about a global trading system, and you cannot expect any two countries to have a balance of, of uh, trade between them or, or current account or merchandise trade. So you Americans, you ought to go back to uh, what you wrote in the first place, which is the sort of uh, liberal economic, uh, economic world. But in fact, when you start running bilateral trade uh, surpluses that get into the high hundreds of billions, uh, you start having a problem, and there is a question as to whether this is really sustainable for any one country to run those kinds of surpluses with another country. And in fact, I would say that China kind of emerged on the economic stage at a time when the uh, world was also going through a technological mm -hmm. transformation, which had the effect of reducing jobs uh, uh, in the U.S. and the manufacturing sector, whether or not there was a country called China. And so China, I think it is fair to say, became a kind of symbol of job loss and ex economic transformation in the U.S. And I think that has been a very, uh, very difficult thing to work on. To be sure, we want China to buy more soybeans and things like that, but that hasn't necessarily uh, fixed the problem, especially for people in the upper Midwest. And today, and without becoming political, I know that's the last thing we do at the uh, Carnegie Council, we have a president who's quite willing to exploit these issues of, um, of uh, job loss and who is to blame for job loss. So that's one, I think, very important aspect of what we're dealing with in China. We also have a country that uh, in China that has enormous ambitions. Uh, again, the Soviet Union was always sort of seen as not a problem that was going to be with us for, for centuries, but rather a problem short term, a dangerous problem. Uh, in some ways it still is, but I think many political scientists would describe the Soviet Union now, if not uh, the Soviet Union back in the 70s, 
uh, as a declining power. And as a declining power, they present some short-term dangers and we need to be uh, addressing those. But China is not a declining power. China is an ascendant power and a power that, uh, whose military expenditures are going up every year and a power that seems to have in, in its mind a military that can challenge the US, not just on the Chinese littoral, but in, broader, in a broader uh, scope in the world. So there's a lot of concern. What does it mean when we see 14% increases in China military spending? What does it mean that they are the only country besides the US to be building frantically, frankly, building uh, uh, aircraft carriers and uh, turning what was essentially a, uh, a littoral type uh, Navy into a blue water Navy. And I think there's a lot of concern about that. Even during the time of the Soviet Union, when they were bringing out uh, new weapon systems, and especially in the nuclear area, but also in the conventional area, there was always the sense that, you know, we had the technological upper hand. If they were going to bring new T-80s through the Folger Gap, well, by golly, we had some very fancy anti-tank uh, missiles. You know, it wasn't just in aircraft, but I mean, we could do stuff uh, with uh, precision guidance that the Soviet Union could only dream about. Now, as we look at the uh, Chinese military, we see that they also have a lot of computer chips in their, in their weapon system. So I think there's a real concern. What are they going to do with all this? Why are they building all this? Uh, they don't have an alliance system. It's not something they're, uh, they haven't uh, uh, certainly worked with uh, many other nations in the case of NATO to talk about peaceful purposes, et cetera. They have their own and they essentially uh, have no allies as they, uh, as they pursue this. So I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of concerns there. So you have the economic issue, you have the military issue, and then you have a China that's increasingly uh, willing to uh, engage itself throughout the world, whether in the North Pole or elsewhere, yes. uh, and, uh, and to be real players uh, uh, politically and as a sort of model of their country. That is, that somehow they have this new model. Our model is, is over. It's passing by. It's not, it's not uh, something that uh, people want to emulate, but the China has this, has this model. And then um, I would say to round out the picture, you have a China model that is not tending toward democracy. I think the, the hope for China, certainly this was the hope that animated uh, deals such as the Hong Kong deal uh, uh, back in 1997, but a sense that China was embracing democracy, embracing participatory um, processes. In fact, you saw some signs of of multi, uh, not multi-party, but multi-candidate uh, yeah. elections, and that there was overall a sort of tendency to move toward us. It wasn't so much as we used to talk about during the Soviet times, where uh, somehow the Soviet Union and, and the U.S. would meet in the middle. I yes. would immediately uh, point out that was never going to be the case. Uh, but there is this sense that China is just not interested in this and sees it as a failed model. And of course, finally, to round this all out, you have a China that is uh, pretty harsh on, dis uh, on dissidents, pretty harsh on, um, on minorities, uh, capable with, because of its technological prowess of following these people from morning till night, face recognition, uh, um, uh, technology and the like. You know, the Russians, the more, most they ever had were a few traffic cameras. Uh, it was nothing at all like this. So you see this marriage of technology and illiberalism that I think is very uh, concerning, uh, concerning to people. And of course, COVID uh, became a case where China's illiberalism seemed to contribute to China's inability to kind of uh, warn the world and otherwise uh, uh, do what it should have been doing to, uh, to protect us from something that uh, for better or worse and for what, whatever reason did come uh, from China. And so now we have an election and amazingly enough, China is sort of front and center on this. Well, you listen to all these issues about China and you think, well, maybe we just ought to either start getting, building our bunkers and crawling underground 
and hoping that this uh, country somehow passes like some terrible storm. Or you start thinking, what are we actually going to do about it? Uh, and I think the, the problem right now, and I think it's very much exacerbated by uh, COVID because COVID kind of brought itself into, uh, uh, into, into many homes in America. It's had a, econo a devastating effect on the economy, if not on Zoom technology, on just about everything else. Uh, so I think COVID uh, was sort of the latest and greatest uh, you know, challenge that we faced. Uh, and we look at where did this all come from? And sadly, the answer is China. So how are we gonna deal with China? Um, my own feeling is China bashing and uh, China uh, hatred uh, is not going to get us there. And I think we ought to turn down the volume a little. Uh, to be sure, the Chinese are, have a pretty amped up volume themselves. I think many of you have heard of wolf diplomacy. And you want wonder, what in the world is wolf diplomacy? And what it refers to is this is interesting because there's a kind of parallelism here where the Chinese worry that their diplomats and not been tough enough. Mm. That after all, the diplomats sit in these, uh, stand around these cocktail parties, sit in these, uh, in these uh, diplomatic dinners, and when they're confronted with the Americans, lo and behold, they seem to knuckle under. They don't seem to push back. They don't seem to say what China is really doing. So there's this criticism within China that uh, not enough, not tough on us. And you can imagine that is happening in the U.S. as well. We also have, and again, I don't want to be political, but we had a sec we have a Secretary of State who goes to China in uh, the, the fall of 2018 to brief the Chinese on the, uh, on the North Korea talks, and I hope I can, we can have time to talk about that. Uh, goes and talks about the, the ideas to brief the Chinese on what is going on in the, in the nuclear talks with North Korea. That day, probably because the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. Uh, Vice President Pence gives a blood curdling speech about the new Cold War and how China is now in effect the Soviet Union. Uh, the um, Chinese uh, didn't really appreciate that. So when, uh, when Pompeo uh, met Wang Yi, the senior Chinese dealing with foreign policy, Wang Yi extended his hand and then held on to Pompeo's hand threw about it in front of the television cameras and uh, told uh, point, um, directing himself to the television cameras why the Americans are all wrong and how they're dealing with China. Pompeo, who's uh, not known for a particularly thin, uh, thick skin on this, uh, smiled wanely, went into the meeting, chewed out the Chinese uh, uh, foreign policy leader. He's not the foreign minister. He's above that. And then... Uh, proceeded to say, I'm not coming back here again. And since the fall of 2018 until now, uh, the U.S. Secretary of State has not made a visit to China. I would submit to you that's not the right approach. And, uh, you know, so often when I was dealing with the Balkans, people would say, we should stop dealing with Milosevic. We should not see him. We should stop dealing with these people. I found when you stop dealing with people, the problem tended to get a lot worse. And so I think we do need to keep up dialogue, but I don't think it should be a dialogue of the deaf and nor should it be a dialogue through press conferences. I think it needs to be some no kidding uh, discussions with the Chinese about how we can find better ways to talk to each other. There are a host of issues as I laid out, but I would start with one of my favorites and that is the always cute and cuddly North Koreans and how we can better deal with that problem. Anyone who thinks the United States can deal with that problem alone, I think is wrong. The U.S. is not going to be able to deal with that problem. And uh, I think the, the process that President Trump has had on North Korea has kind of proven that. He went to talk to them in Singapore. Actually, I didn't think that was such a terrible idea. But uh, as with a lot of things, well, I don't care that whether it's cooking or whatever, you should do some preparation before you get to the stove. And uh, I think there was very little preparation for Singapore. There seemed to be even less preparation for the meeting in Hanoi. And finally, we have bas basically nothing to show for it with North Korea except three years of lost time. 
In the meantime, we have not worked closely with the Chinese. We have not wor worked closely enough with our two allies, Japan and South Korea. And one has the impression that if there were a second Trump administration, we would sort of go along in this direction with nothing being done. Most worrisomely, I think, is that uh, the president indicated in Singapore that he would like to bring US troops back from South Korea. And you have to ask yourself the question, if we bring troops back from South Korea, what will happen in the, in the South Korean Chinese relationship? Would we see an even emboldened uh, China? Would we see a South Korea that's got to kind of work more with China? What would be the relationship in, in Japan? Now, Japan has just changed uh, prime ministers in the last 24 hours. Uh, they had a prime minister, whether you like Shinzo Abe or not. He was, a, he was a veteran ball player there. He knew how to play the game. Uh, but now he's gone. So how is that all going to, uh, would, how would that work if the U.S. decided to pull troops out of uh, uh, South Korea in the, in the expectation or hopes of getting something from the North Koreans? Would the, China, would the Japanese be okay being the only country in Asia yeah. with U.S. troops? After all, those U.S. troops went there in 1945 for, how should I put it, a different purpose. <laughs> and uh, would, uh, would the Japanese be satisfied with that? So I think there's a lot at stake here in these relationships. I think the U.S. does need to kind of find some more patterns of cooperation, not only with China, which is a very big challenge, but also with some of our, our partners and neighbors. Clearly, we need to hold some of those partners and neighbors uh, or partners and allies, I should say, closely with respect to China's effort to unilaterally take the South China Sea and turn it into a Southern Chinese lake. lake. Uh, we cannot uh, accept that, but at the same time, our non-acceptance of that, I think, would be a lot more effective if we could work with other countries, the uh, um, uh, maritime countries in uh, Southeast Asia, and work with them on how China can understand that, can be brought to understand that they may have a policy position that we don't like, but they don't have to act on the policy. And I think that is the big problem. Many countries have policy positions. Uh, countries have territorial disputes. You would be amazed at the territorial disputes that go on uh, in places like Europe, but there's never any acting on it. And I think the issue is to try to get ourselves in a position where China realizes it's not in its, in its interest to act on these issues. We need to... Uh, work with these other countries so that we are not always taking point. And uh, in the case of some of the Chinese issues uh, on the economic issue, where we've been very concerned about uh, what we consider theft of uh, intellectual property rights, the Chinese would disagree, but whatever it is, it's been an extortion of, uh, or an attempt to take technology when our companies didn't want to give it up and felt they had to in order to have economic uh, to have some economic benefit that they, that they really needed. Well, we need to understand that many of our European allies have the same uh, problems with China. So why are we creating problems with European allies when we should be working with them on China? We should have a much more of an effort to say, look, the China, look to the Chinese, it's not just us, we have European allies as well. And I think the US needs to kind of overall leverage our position. Now, some, some would argue that by calling the Pacific the Indo-Pacific, we are leveraging our position. And what a brilliant strategy this is to uh, kind of uh, rejigger re the world map and somehow make India an East Asian uh, country. It sounds like a pretty brilliant idea until you look at a map. And uh, it doesn't really work that way. It is not to say that India doesn't have a lot of concerns with yes. China, and we've seen some of those uh, concerns going on in the Himalayas. And it doesn't mean that we can't work with India on issues of uh, how to manage China. But I think we need to be very careful that we're not appearing to try to encircle China. Because when you go back to the uh, 1972, to the Shanghai Accords, 
what we were able to do essentially is to make China, they were already feeling the sense of Soviet encirclement. You recall at the time, the Soviet Union was always talking about bases in Cameron Bay and places like that. China was very concerned about this, uh, this uh, potential of encirclement by the Soviet Union. And that was for us a great source of leverage that we were able to work with China and I would say very, and, and I think this is not my thought, but a very profound thought, which is by uh, the, the Sino-US rapprochement essentially ended uh, the Soviet Union and ended the Cold War. So something that was clearly in our interest to pursue. And I think we need to get a little smarter now and think of those issues of how to pursue them. You know, these, these ethics issues, these, uh, um, uh, issues of human rights in China are very real. And uh, we need to help shape a world in which China looks at the shape of that world and decides it's got to do things differently. That is going to be a lot more effective than banging our fist at the UN, or as Khrushchev used to do, taking off one of his shoes and banging his shoe at the UN. But in some cases, it looks to be the same sort of thing. So we need to kind of work on this. And most of all, we need to have some dialogue, some capacity to talk to people, not just in public, not just uh, uh, through social media, which I consider the bane of diplomacy, but uh, you know, it's here to stay. I'm not going to argue it, but uh, I think we need to have a much better uh, dialogue. I think step by step is always good. I always felt you'd get the North Koreans to move one step. They'd look around and say, it's not so bad. Let's move another step rather than expect some circus act where they will do a double backflip and land on their feet. And that's the, uh, the end of the show. So it's going to be a process but we need to get a lot smarter about diplomacy. And I would argue to be smart about diplomacy is to engage in diplomacy with actual diplomats. You know, there's nothing wrong with diplomats. Uh, and I would say American diplomats are a lot better than our country may think we are. You look at Hollywood's portrayal of American diplomats, always some craven looking person behind a big desk with a couple of flags behind him, and it's always a him. We need to get over that idea and understand that diplomats can be a real force multiplier, especially in a part of the world that is as important and as vast as the Asia Pacific. So Nick, I think I've talked a lot too long, but we can now start much more of a dialogue on this. Oh, no, you've, you've covered a perfect, uh, perfect timing. You've covered a lot of issues. You've anticipated, I think, some of the questions uh, that we have. Um, and uh, I will take my prerogative uh, as, the, uh, as the moderator to start us off. And then I believe uh, uh, Alex Woodson from the uh, council is moderating and curating the uh, uh, queries and comments from the audience. So I'll invite him after uh, to, to begin uh, uh, giving you those, uh, those reactions. Uh, but I did wanna come back. I think a, a very important point that you've raised at several points, you talked about this with regard to Yugoslavia, North Korea, to China, that, uh, we have to talk uh, that there are regimes out there that have, uh, they can influence, they have power, uh, they can affect the board as it were, uh, and not talking to them uh, is not an option if there are other things at stake. You know, we, we don't want North Korea to use nuclear weapons. Uh, China is simply too big of a, of a country uh, in the international system. Uh, we can't, you know, ever hope to, to isolate it. Uh, and I think that in the past, it does seem that we kind of were able to square that circle. I think, as you had noted, that 20 years ago, the, the narrative was, is that China is liberalizing so that they're going to move closer to where we are on, on certain issues of values, of governance, of human rights. Uh, and therefore that justifies the engagement. Whereas now it does seem that China has drawn some very clear line saying we are not the term they're going to use, but from our perspective that they are committed to an illiberal form of governance and that they're not going to um, continue moving in a direction that we would like. How for a diplomat who has a mandate 
to get certain concrete things accomplished. We don't want conflict in the South China Sea. We want to ensure uh, smooth running uh, at the United Nations, where both China and the United States are veto-wielding powers. We want to make sure that the global commons remain open. Uh, at what point do the values questions, say, of human rights, how do they get uh, assigned uh, and ranked when you are when you are engaged in talks across the table, and when you're engaged with talks, and I'm thinking in the case of the North Koreans, where you are dealing with people that meta metaphorically or even literally may in fact have quote unquote blood on their hands for things that they've done, yet we still need to deal with them. Can you can you give us a sense of what it's like as a diplomat to have to navigate um, dealing with uh, governments and representatives uh, where, on the one hand, you'd like to say, I don't want to give you the time of day. But on the other hand, if I don't talk to you, there are worse outcomes, which in terms will have worse outcomes for values. Uh, you know, it will risk war or some great catastrophe. So how, how have you been able to reconcile that or, or deal with that in your own career and, and any, any advice moving forward for for people that have to kind of uh, to, to, to grapple with that, uh, that question? Well, as your question implies, it's, it is very difficult. I mean, there is a point at which you don't talk to people. Uh, I think the U.S. was entirely correct not to talk to Nazi Germany. I mean, I, I think there's just a point at which you got to stop. So the question, or, or not start, uh, yeah. the question is, of course, where do you get to that point? Um, I think a key issue is what do you think you can accomplish from the talks? Uh, can you make something better? In making something better, can you also affect uh, the situation of, uh, of, the, uh, of human rights? I think often you can. Uh, I have been in discussions uh, Again, I don't want to draw analogies between Slobodan Milosevic and, and the Chinese. I think it's kind of unfair yes, to the Chinese. Yes. But, uh, you know, there were times when um, if you can't uh, change an overall system, you can, change, uh, you can change that system for a few people. You can spring people from prison. Uh, you can make sure that when you talk to uh, these regimes, you do not lose track of these issues of ethics and human rights, and they have a role in how you approach things. Now with North Korea, my own view, I remember uh, not to quote one of my Russian counterparts, but he said, you Americans, you don't think this is hard enough and now you're going to be talking about human rights. You don't think it's already hard enough on the nuclear side. He had a point, but um, I think, uh, I had a point too, and I told my North Korean counterpart, uh, we are prepared uh, in the context of a denuclearizing North Korea to pursue a normal relationship with North Korea in the context of denuclearizing, not a North Korea that doesn't denuclearize. We pursue a, North, uh, a normal relationship and stand around and wait for them to do the right thing. These are all sort of action for action. You do this, we do this. But then I told them that when we get to the point of establishing any kind of relationship, we are going to have to, and I said have to because it's part of our value system, we're going to have to pursue the issue of human rights. I know you don't want to hear that, but what, we'll, what we would do is have a track in the context of any normalization with North Korea to kind of measure where we are on human rights and what can be done to improve it. Now, as I said, you often start by saying, can we spring these people from prison? Can we do this? It's got to be very incremental. And I think uh, the problem with human rights abusers uh, is they believe that this type of, uh, of um, roughness with their own public is how they hold on to power. So it's very tough to get them to stop that because they feel that they're going to not be able to hold on to power the minute they stop that. So what you try to do is get a few things done. Uh, and what you don't do is try to humiliate them publicly. I'll give you another example with China. 
um, North Koreans would escape into China, uh, sometimes an amazing, uh, with amazing journeys, but they somehow made it into China. And they sometimes made it into China with the great help of private groups. And, uh, you know, I am all in favor of that. What I'm not in favor of the private group uh, is that the private group drops the uh, refugee family at an American installation and then has a press conference to the effect that they have succeeded in getting these North Koreans into an American diplomatic establishment. And by the way, send us more money and we'll do this again. Um, I think this is, you know, when you're talking about people's lives and it's individuals' lives, you need to be very careful how you do that. And you need to be very careful not to use individuals in the pursuit of, you know, your own, your own goals. In the case of, uh, of North Koreans who ended up in U.S. Uh, uh, hands in China, uh, sleeping in the basement of our consulate somewhere, I found it very useful, especially if we could keep it out of the public eye, to go to the Chinese and figure out how we could get them out. I found it very useful to have a good relationship with the South Koreans and an understanding that we were doing as much for that relationship as we could, and therefore they would do as much for us as they could. And people who think that diplomacy is just about individual transactions kind of miss the point of a broader, of a broader approach. I was talking to the, uh, I served in Macedonia at one point, I was talking to the Macedonian uh, prime Minister, and uh, the issue was Albanian language in Albanian majority villages. And could they learn Albanian in the schools rather than uh, the language Macedonia, which was the majority language, but not in these Albanian dominated uh, uh, towns. And uh, I remember the, the Prime Minister said to me, you know, this is very hard for me. This is very hard. You, you have no idea the opposition I get in parliament when I suggest going along with this, with these types of, of uh, issues. But then he said to me, but I value the relationship with the US. I know that my country's future is tied to our ability to have a good relationship with you, with, with the United States. And therefore we're gonna try to get this done. So essentially, he, you, you first convince them that the relationship is important. And by the way, to do that, you kind of have to swallow on a couple of things and pick your battles your and not blast. Uh, you know, if you're a tiny country like Macedonia, there are, there are more than a tiny number of things that you can uh, complain about. So you kind of, you're careful with that, but what you are, are clear about is the degree to which the United States cares about Macedonia. And when people feel that, they're prepared to do things because they know the relationship is important. You know, um, it's all, and by the way, diplomacy is no different from one's personal uh, uh, life. You know, when you're dealing with somebody, you try to understand where they're coming from on an issue. And, you know, for Americans, you know, we've been so blessed to live in this country and to be far away from some of these terrible issues. And you ought to stop to think, how would I do if I were that yeah. prime minister of Macedonia, let's say? How would I handle that issue? And so you just develop a little empathy, a little understanding of where the other person is coming from. And then, you know, read a few history books and you'll be ready to be a diplomat. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. That's, and I think that's important, both the, uh, the empathy question and also understanding that, uh, you know, every country has domestic politics and uh, political leaders have constituencies and, uh, you know, understanding how to navigate those are, are, are quite important. Weirdly, even brutal dictatorships can. Have yes, even even brutal dictatorships have domestic politics. So and again, the issue isn't to knuckle under to this stuff. The issue is to understand it. Yes. And I think as any negotiator does, you try to take something that you know is more valuable to the other guy than it is to you. And then you try to take something that you know is more value to yourself than to the other guy and see if through this process of policy arbitrage, uh, if you will, you can find ways to make progress because neither side feel, feels they're giving up a lot 
but each side feels they're getting a lot. That they're getting, yeah. If, if you can figure out the relative value of stuff, and the only way to do that is to listen hard and kind of get a sense of what they really care about. I'll tell you, though, dealing with the North Koreans, you think they'd want something, you'd go and move heaven and earth for it, and then they wanted it until they didn't want until it. Until they didn't want it, yeah. So they uh, they can be a real challenge, especially on this, this nuclear question, yeah. which I used to tell them, I said, we got a lot of options for dealing with that. That was diplomatese as a threat. Yeah. I said, we have a lot of options. We don't have the option of walking away. We're not going to walk away from this. And um, we're not going to accept you as a nuclear state. And I think some points that you want to make, you better be willing to make them 50 times. Mm. I mean, advertisers do it all the time. You don't just see one beer ad. That wouldn't make you want to drink beer. You'd see another 49 beer ads, you know, maybe I'll try it. Maybe I'll try it. And I think in diplomacy, you have to keep emphasizing and repeating yourself. And because that's the way you establish a kind of level of effort. This is important to me. Okay, got it? <laughs> you know. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, Alex, if I can ask you to uh, uh, give us a sense of the, uh, the chat uh, and uh, questions and comments for the ambassador. Sure. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Ambassador Hill. So we have some great questions. Uh, for the first one, I'm going to ask one that connects back to the U.S., which is uh, the subject of this webinar. So this is from Krister Lansing. Um, is the focus on economic trade deals with China soybean purchases overblown? Is this simply a political football to pander to U.S. heartland voters? How much, econo how much economic influence does China have over the U.S. situation? Yeah. Well, I would be shocked if there's really politics involved in this. Uh, on the other hand, I think we need to understand that you bet, you bet there is politics. That said, I think um, it's, a good, it's a good idea to pursue trade negotiations that uh, help uh, employ Americans and uh, presumably create a circumstance where maybe those bilateral deficits will go down. Not that it's necessarily meaningful in terms of, uh, in terms of, the, uh, uh, of the economy directly, but I think it's meaningful in terms of the, uh, political, um, uh, the political setting that you're dealing with so that you can make some more and what are often tougher uh, decisions to, for example, open the Chinese market, uh, have better protections for your intellectual property rights, et cetera. So I, I don't fault the, this, uh, the current administration for, uh, for uh, pursuing these economic deals. Obviously, I don't rule out the fact, and we know this from a number of sources. I never thought I'd quote John Bolton, but you know, uh, he, he was there in the room, as he likes to say. So um, I, I think it's been, it's probably, been the right thing to approach these things. Where I worry is the um, to try to turn this these things into uh, cliffhangers and otherwise to, I think, create a lot of enmity where we're trying to calm things down. And uh, I think this administration needs to learn the value of calming things down because people think straighter when they're calm. Okay. We'll go to Shelly Garrett for the next question. Is there something happening in China's internal politics causing China to become more aggressive on several fronts? <laughs> Hong Kong, the East and South China Sea, Xinjiang, et cetera. That's a, that's, a, uh, that's a very important question. And it's because usually when you see a country kind of misbehaving uh, externally, you can bet that there are kind of pressures going on internally. And the trick is to figure out what they are and to understand the dynamics and especially to understand the relationship between the external and internal. For example, uh, if you a few years ago, I was surprised to learn that in China, uh, on their equivalent of uh, these uh, um, these uh, social media platforms, there was criticism of the Chinese government to the effect, why are you allowing the Vietnamese to get away with this? Why are we allowing them to push us around in what really should be our uh, South China Sea? And uh, 
you know, there's a lot of there's cynicism to go halfway around the world on this. You could say the government is kind of pushing people to say stuff. And then the government says, oh, we have to act because our people want to. I mean, there's a lot of that. But uh, don't discount the idea that if you're a uh, citizen in China and you're basically not happy with the government, you may try to flank it on the nationalist side and not just on the, gee, government can't you be more liberal? So uh, I do not rule out these things. Uh, I would have thought, and I did think, uh, that Xi Jinping would have said, hey, enough already. We've turned good relations uh, with uh, Southeast Asian nations and turned them into bad relations because of our aggressiveness. We need to stop this. And he sure as heck hasn't stopped it at all. I mean, it's not just creating facts on the ground in, uh, in these uh, uh, islands or islets around uh, South China Sea. He's, he's create, created the ground itself by you know, dumping dirt on them, on these uh, atolls and otherwise uh, you know, creating more, uh, more, more of China there. So I think um, uh, the questioner is right to look at this and I think it does happen. But uh, I think one has to kind of hold the government accountable, whether or not it has pressures. And, uh, you know, I, I remember uh, in, in Iraq, I mean, you would hear, uh, you know, all these excuses for everything. And it usually was the people don't want me to do that. Well, that's what leadership is about, is to convince people that you're doing something because for a greater good and for the country's greater good. And I just don't accept every politician who says, I can't do this because my base doesn't want me to. I'm not making any current analogies with any politicians. So this is a somewhat related question from George below. Uh, the question is, Xi Jinping not only has hardcore, in quotes, hardcore nationalists with, anti, with an anti-colonialist bent who are largely in the ascendancy, he also has hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Western educated bureaucrats who are not as hostile to the US or to Japan, India and other Southeast and Northeast Asian countries. What chance, if any, is there for this alternative faction to gain more traction within this DCP? Well, you know, um, Xi Jinping is a very powerful leader, but I'm not sure I'd wanna, if I were a US president, I'm not sure I'd wanna switch inboxes because uh, I think he has uh, as the question implies, a lot of uh, a lot of different forces uh, uh, behind him. I think the ones you know, if you look at polling data of the ones who come back from overseas uh, education, uh, they tend to be kind of hardline. If you look at the polling data of them, I wouldn't necessarily take that to heart. Uh, if I were coming back from you know uh, four years at uh, at uh, some U.S. university, I might be careful not to say that I've uh, bought the line there. Um, at the same time, I think China has a lot of uh, uh, internal uh, tensions. Um, they, um, you know, it's a it's quite a nationalist country. I mean, you go to any city in China and you see flags everywhere, and don't assume they're all being put up by people in charge of the flag installers of the Communist Party. There's, there's a lot of pride in China. And uh, there's a lot of pride in the Olympic Games they had. There'll be a lot of pride in, the, in their Winter Olympics coming up. I mean, China, it's a very prideful nation. And I think one has to be uh, understand that when you deal with them. And if you want to try to uh, humiliate them publicly, uh, you better anticipate what their next step might be. And uh, I really think diplomacy, we need to get back to some traditional forms of diplomacy where you go in a room, you don't have to fill it up with cigarette smoke. Uh, even the Chinese banned cigarettes at the uh, foreign ministry. But, uh, you know, you shut the door and uh, what happens in the room should stay in the room until you have a real deal. And I think there's just too much of this uh, 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 idea that you have to repeat everything you've done in, in social media. Okay, maybe time for one more question. This one just came in from Francisco Castaneda. Uh, do you think the US should get more involved with ASEAN to understand better the region and have a, I guess to understand better the region and have, have, have yeah. different, different views on it? 
I think we, we should. Now, during my watch, it was kind of frustrating because we held them at arm's length. We mm. held ASEAN at arm's length. Why do we hold them at arm's length? Because ASEAN wanted to do more with Burma than we wanted to do with Burma. And therefore, we thought uh, to be, uh, you know, having our president go to too many ASEAN meetings was somehow uh, giving in to the ASEAN view that Burma needed to be one of them. I think that was really wrongheaded. Um, you know, there was a certain point in the, uh, uh, during the Bush administration where the U.S. was really trying to throw the book at, at uh, Burma and, you know, for, you know, maybe many good reasons. But I remember the Singaporean uh, foreign minister at the time told me, you look at, Ger at Burma as a big human rights problem. We do, too. What you don't understand is, is it's also a big piece of real estate. And we, it has the choice of being part of the China world, part of the Indian world, or part of the ASEAN world. And we want that last outcome. And so we will continue to pursue uh, relationships with Burma. I think that made a lot of sense. And so uh, no question the U.S. needs to be uh, uh, working more, more closely with a association that, after all, embraces some half a billion people. Uh, that's the population of the ASEAN members in Southeast Asia. No question we should be doing more. But And no question we can bring up our issues that are more important to us than maybe uh, to others. But we should be careful not to expect them to knuckle under to our to our views while we don't necessarily listen to their views. So I think the problem of multilateral organizations, which ASEAN uh, represents, is Americans need to understand that you need to work with what people are interested in. I think most politicians understand that. You don't just go and tell everyone what you want to do. You do a little listening, too. And I think uh, the United States needs to do a better job uh, of listening when we meet these multilateral organizations because they won't have the same agenda that we do. It's not necessarily contrary, but it's things that, uh, that we may have not wanted to uh, necessarily deal with. But you do it because that's the best way to get them to focus on your agenda as well. Well, Ambassador Hill, thank you very much. This. Uh... It, it's, uh, it, it feels like we've covered more than just uh, one hour's worth of, of topics, uh, but uh, being able in this time frame to have really had such a wide ranging discussion. Uh, and I think in the end, really to the point that, you know, diplomacy is really not something that pundits do on social media, but uh, requires uh, investment, time, expertise. Uh, and, uh, you know, giving a little to get something uh, and having that uh, link to a long range uh, assessment of, of where you want to go and, and what matters to you. So uh, this uh, has been an excellent presentation. I hope that uh, everyone uh, benefits from it. Uh, I certainly hope uh, that your voice will continue to be one uh, that uh, administrations will be soliciting as we move forward into the future, uh, as we continue to grapple with these issues, but also thank you for uh, this act of education to uh, a broader audience that is uh, interested in these things and getting us to appreciate really a lot of what happens behind the scenes and the challenges uh, that uh, you have faced and that uh, others will continue to face in trying to, as you put it in the end, create uh, outcomes uh, where uh, everyone benefits and we move forward uh, in a positive direction. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for joining us today. Uh, please uh, do look at the uh, Carnegie Council site for uh, future webinars that will be happening. And of course, all our previous webinars are archived, uh, both by video and by transcript, so that you can uh, consult that. And certainly, uh, if you had friends and colleagues who could not be with us for this live event, uh, certainly pass along to them that uh, the repository of today's conversations uh, will be made available, uh, both at the Carnegie site as well as on our, on our YouTube channel. And so with that, uh, thank you very much. And I bid everyone a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.